Aloha, and welcome to our focusing on the United Nations. And what we'll be focusing on today is what has happened so far at the most recent General Assembly of the UN. And we're going to look at the most important issues that are happening here that we should focus on and how they relate to Hawaii. What we'll be looking at today is really the most important issue for the next year that will participate for the next 15 years, and that's the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the UN SDGs. And the UN SDGs are very important. They are 17 of them right now. And the UNA USA local chapter will be hosting a SDG consultation. And at the SDG consultation that will be take place that we began on International Day of Peace, September 21st, but will conclude on International Human Rights Day on December 10th, We'll be having a series of UPR consultations, but more importantly, UPR consultations that focuses on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Besides the Sustainable Development Goals, what we'll talk about today that we think is quite valuable is looking at what has happened so far. What's happened so far at the UN is the new session began with the UN Climate Change Summit. At the UN Climate Change Summit, we actually had many heads of state appear and make pledges on how they plan to come up with policies that allow us to avoid a climate catastrophe, to avoid this climate crisis that we are facing right now. Uh, what we'll be showing from that is there's many speeches from heads of state, but we think it's important, since it didn't get as much coverage in the United States as it could have, to focus on President Barack Obama's speech that he gave to the Climate Change Summit. Another element that we want to include that we think is quite valuable is also the closing speech of the opening address. There we had a UH Manoa graduate come and speak from the Marshall Islands. She actually gave an amazing poem, so we'll feature that as well because she made a poem to her brand new baby about not worrying because the commitment that she makes as well as all the people that have participated in the climate march that brought over 400 thousand people to the streets of New York the day before. The other part that we'll feature as well, which I think will be quite valuable, is actually the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And also, what we think was really valuable, of course, is the next steps for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we're very fortunate to have with us today from UNA, UN Foundation. Uh, we're working together and partnering here in Hawaii but with the national chapter because there's actually sustainable development goal consultations across the country and Hawaii is just one of the states that was fortunate enough to be part of this campaign and we wanted to just welcome Santa Clara to be able to share with us a little bit about what other states are doing and maybe some of the exciting things that have happened so far. Let's see if we can get our volume up. Just a second, we're gonna get it. Do you see over there where we can? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. I think you might have muted yourself. I can't hear you, but. How about now? Yeah, so okay. I'm good to go, all right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so as Josh was saying, we have um, over the past couple of weeks, um, been having these uh, consultations focused on the sustainable development goals that have been taking place in, in states and cities all around the country. Um, with the when the initiative started, we selected 33 um, uh, to, to hold these consultations. And basically, the purpose of these consultations is to um, help to educate communities about about the post-2015 development agenda. A lot of people don't understand what's happening after the Millennium Development Goals, goals expire. They don't understand that it's a process um, in place or that's taking place now and in, in the hopes of determining what, what will succeed the Millennium Development Goals. And so we um, are hoping to educate communities about that, but then also sort of gain input from from the communities on what they want to see in the in the post-2015 development agenda and then from there, um, 
kind of get their support, their long-term support, so that whatever is implemented, whatever is decided upon, will be um, supported by people in that community. And they can kind of work with their local elected officials or their federally elected officials with organizations to um, to contribute to whatever is the new post-2015 development agenda. And so we've had events. We've had, I think, about 17 events so far. And we have another 12 or 13 that are going to be taking place. Um, and they've been really, really great. I mean, one event which took place in Westchester, New York, had about 115 people there. And what was really exciting about it was there were um, about 75 students between you know middle school and college age students that were there and engaging in this process. And that's been something we've really wanted to make sure was a voice that is heard in these consultations and these discussions with, with young people um, and, and getting them, you know, because it's something that will be affecting them from 2015 till 2030 and it's what will um, sort of be part of a part of their their life, um, and, and and so it's an important thing for us. Um, another you know great example is Columbus, Ohio, which you know you don't usually think of as like this big international community, um, but they had this big event with a hundred people um, coming to talk on the different um, discuss the different goals. They focus a lot on gender equality, in particular, and um, you know had, I think, a really good and vibrant discussion about um, gender equality and why that's important on the global development agenda, but why that's also an, an important discussion to have here. You know, um, November November 25th is the day, um, uh, day to, to prevent or against uh, gender-based violence. And so um, we know there's a lot of that that happens here in this country as well. And so that was a big and important part of their discussion. Um, you know, it's we have events that have taken place all throughout California, New York, but then also places like um, Connecticut, um, Texas, and Dallas. Uh, we have an event happening in Oklahoma City. And then what's really exciting is that um, outside of these 33 events, we actually have other chapters in other cities that have sort of joined and gotten on board with this process. So we had an event in Maine that we weren't anticipating, but they decided to do one. We had one in um, in North Carolina, um, in uh, sort of near Raleigh, and then we've been having them in, in Southern Illinois at Carbondale University. Um, and so it's it's really exciting, and um, we're we're also you know happy that uh, the UNA chapter in Hawaii is going to be hosting as well and representing that part of the country. Um, so it's. That's just a little bit from me. Is that is that helpful, Josh? That is helpful. We were just excited to hear what other people were doing. And then just to get an insight, and that's also great for people in Hawaii to be able to see, you know, our national partners. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think something that a lot of people have been doing is just involving other organizations um, within their communities to be part of it. I know that in, in Kentucky, for example, in Louisville, they brought the mayor um, to their event, and they are working with their mayor to um, ratify uh, CEDAW at sort of the local level, at the city level. And so it's, again, that great um, interaction between this is the UN, it's global, you know, it's big, but then how does it relate to um, the local context? And in this case, it's taking CEDAW, this convention that the US has never signed, and kind of having it ratified by I Louis, so that they hold themselves accountable to what the UN has outlined as basic rights for women and girls. So that's another cool example. Um, and um, yeah, there's there's a lot. It's it's been exciting to to see Gainesville, um, the chapter in Gainesville, Florida. They again made it a very youth focused event and actually had students from the Model UN group kind of come and talk about post 2015 and what it means to them and why it's important and. Um, and kind of led the discussion in that way and sort of flipped it on its head rather than have experts and saying this is how it is. They had the students come and kind of say this is how we, this is how it is, and this is why we think it's important. So um, it's, it's exciting to see all the different approaches. That's great. So far, 
Uh, we were able to launch ours on International Day of Peace, and we launched a, uh, it's our Honolulu F Human Rights Film Festival that takes place at the Doris Duke Academy of Arts. And our focus was on climate change, one of the SDGs, and we actually featured a film that was made in Fiji at the University of South Pacific, focusing on how, since we're in Hawaii, how the Pacific Islands will have to be dealing with climate change. And the film was called Moana, which is, of course, the name for the Pacific here among the indigenous peoples. And we also had the filmmaker, Vilsoni Heronico, on the panel, as well as a professor from the Solomon Islands, and then another professor from uh, Tonga and Fiji to be able to describe what's going on. So that was a very important event for us for our kickoff. And then we're going to continue the climate change theme because the uh, Hilo chapter did a great job on UN Day where they mm -hmm. focused on what was going on with climate change in the Pacific. So we're working with the teachers that spoke there, describing how Pacific Islanders are using adaptation to combat climate change to also share their story. So we're going to definitely have climate change, ocean, gender, and we're working with local NGOs to generate awareness around the SDGs, as well as local farmers. We have an organic farm out in Waianae, Ma'o Farm, where I grew up, and we were talking with them as well to participate and even making a curriculum that we might be able to teach here at the University of Hawaii as a result of these consultations. So, so far it's been coming along really well. And one of our members, Chris, has been doing a great job at Children and Youth Day. We also got the polling and the votes. So we let all the youth in elementary and middle school and high school vote on what they see as the most important SDGs that they should be voting on. And we'll continue doing that. We'll be doing a couple of those here in November. We'll be meeting with BYU, Brigham Young University. They're having a model UN focusing on sustainable development in the Pacific. So we'll be doing that as a new thing on the 25th, on the Tuesday. And uh, that'll be in the afternoon. But then in the morning from 12 to 1, we'll be connecting everyone the same way we're co connecting you to all the campuses. So we should be having a couple of exciting things, but so much more to do. And we really do like this process where we know the MDGs were actually still quite important and incredible to actually get the world to agree on those eight MDGs. But we also know that we've learned that many people saw those as top down and then only for developing countries. And what we really like about the sustainable development goals is every country will kind of have a role and also be held accountable. And so I know I just got back from Geneva at the Universal Periodic Review and they're trying to come up with a mechanism for the SDGs where each country will report. So we're excited to see how that all developed and very excited to hear in Hawaii to be able to participate. So. Fantastic. Well, sounds like you're doing amazing things and um, just we are, if you need anything from us on our end, definitely let us know. And I, uh, you know, it, it sounds like a fantastic work and just a great way of reaching out, you know, well beyond this UNA community to really talk about this this big policy decision that's underway and how we can be part of it. That's great. Don, do, do you have any question or? No. Okay. Really we're really, thank you for making time, especially on a, as it's later there on the East Coast. And no uh, when I arrive on Thursday, how about if I just try to come Thursday around the same time, around 4.30 or 5? That should work great. That okay. Works I'll put it on my calendar. Okay. And then we can go over different aspects of it, but we'll make sure we have everything done appropriately and that we have a great event here and we can learn from the other places and see their banners and great ways that they advertise so we can do that better here in Hawaii. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you so much. Have a good day. Yep, of course. <laughs> Take care. All right. Aloha. Bye. Bye. So that was a, a good example of what we're looking at of potential things that we can do and also connecting our work here in Hawaii with uh, the national movement. Like I said, we thought the first thing we should focus on, the most important, would definitely be the Climate Change Summit. Uh, the Climate Change Summit was an idea from Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to bring everyone together to say, look, right now we're a couple of months away from the Lima-Peru Conference of Parties what can we do now to change the situation so we don't have a similar condition like in Copenhagen 
and governments, please share what you're going to propose and what you see that is new that your government will be able to do to be this catalyst for change. So we normally don't see speeches of our president at the UN enough. Uh, we started having this as an annual event now for six years. And so this climate change summit, we have the speech from Barack Obama. So we'll show that first. Then we'll show the closing statement by Kathy. And then uh, we'll look at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples that also wrapped up. So here's the first one. Secretary General, fellow leaders, for all the immediate challenges that we get gathered to address this week, terrorism, instability, inequality, disease, there's one issue that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent and growing threat of a changing climate. Five years have passed since many of us met in Copenhagen. And since then, our understanding of climate change has advanced, both in the deepening science that says this once distant threat has moved firmly into the present, and into the sting of more frequent extreme weather events that show us exactly what these changes may mean for future generations. No nation is immune. In America, the past decade has been our hottest on record. Along our eastern coast, the city of Miami now floods at high tide. In our west, wildfire season now stretches most of the year. In our heartland, farms have been parched by the worst drought in generations and drenched by the wettest spring in our history. A hurricane left parts of this great city dark and underwater, and some nations already live with far worse. Worldwide, this summer was the hottest ever recorded, with global carbon emissions still on the rise. So the climate is changing faster than our efforts to address it. The alarm bells keep ringing. Our citizens keep marching. We cannot pretend we do not hear them. We have to answer the call. We know what we have to do to avoid irreparable harm. We have to cut carbon pollution in our own countries to prevent the worst effects of climate change. We have to adapt to the impacts that, unfortunately, we can no longer avoid. And we have to work together as a global community to tackle this global threat before it is too late. We cannot condemn our children and their children to a future that is beyond their capacity to repair. Not when we have the means the technological innovation and the scientific imagination to begin the work of repairing it right now. As one of America's governors has said, we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. So today I am here personally as the leader of the world's largest economy, and its second largest emitter to say that we have begun to do something about it. The United States has made ambitious investments in clean energy and ambitious reductions in our carbon emissions. We now harness three times as much electricity from the wind and ten times as much from the sun as we did when I came into office. Within a decade, our cars will go twice as far on a gallon of gas, and already every major automaker offers electric vehicles. 
We've made unprecedented investments to cut energy waste in our homes and our buildings and our appliances, all of which will save consumers billions of dollars, and we are committed to helping communities build climate-resilient infrastructure. So all told, these advances have helped create jobs, grow our economy, and drive our carbon pollution to its lowest levels in nearly two decades, proving that there does not have to be a conflict between a sound environment and strong economic growth. Over the past eight years, the United States has reduced our total carbon pollution by more than any other nation on Earth. But we have to do more. Last year, I issued America's first climate action plan to double down on our efforts. Under that plan, my administration is working with states and utilities to set first-ever standards to cut the amount of carbon pollution our power plants can dump into the air. And when completed, this will mark the single most important and significant step the United States has ever taken to reduce our carbon emissions. Last week alone, we announced an array of new actions in renewable energy and energy efficiency that will save consumers more than $10 billion on their energy bills and cut carbon pollution by nearly 300 million metric tons through 2030. That's the equivalent of taking more than six, uh, 60 million cars off the road for one year. I also convened a group of private sector leaders who have agreed to do their part to slash consumption of dangerous greenhouse gases known as HFCs, slash them 80 percent by 2050. And already more than 100 nations have agreed to launch talks to phase down HFCs under the Montreal Protocol, the same agreement the world used successfully to phase out ozone-depleting chemicals. And this is something that President Xi of China and I have worked on together. Just a few minutes ago, I met with Chinese Vice Premier uh, Zhang Goli and reiterated my belief that as the two largest economies and emitters in the world, we have a special responsibility to lead. That's what big nations have to do. And today I call on all countries to join us, not next year or the year after that, but right now, because no nation can meet this global threat alone. The United States has engaged more allies and partners to cut carbon pollution and prepare for the impacts we cannot avoid. All told, American climate assistance now reaches more than 120 nations around the world. We're helping more nations skip past the dirty phase of development using current technologies, not duplicating the same mistakes and environmental degradation that took place previously. We're partnering with African entrepreneurs to launch clean energy projects. We're helping farmers practice climate-smart agriculture and plant more durable crops. We're building international coalitions to drive action from reducing methane emissions from pipelines to launching a free trade agreement for environmental goods. And we have been working shoulder to shoulder with many of you to make the Green Climate Fund a reality. But let me be honest, none of this is without controversy. In each of our countries, there are interests that will be resistant to action. And in each country, there is a suspicion that if we act and other countries don't, that we will be at an economic disadvantage. But we have to lead. That is what the United Nations and this General Assembly is about. Now, the truth is, is that no matter what we do, some populations will still be at risk. The nations that contribute the least to climate change often stand to lose the most. And that's why, since I took office, the United States has expanded our direct adaptation assistance eightfold. And we're going to do more. Today, I'm directing our federal agencies to begin factoring climate resilience into our international development programs and investments. 
And I'm announcing a new effort to deploy the unique scientific and technological capabilities of the United States from climate data to early warning systems. So this effort includes a new partnership that will draw on the resources and expertise of our leading private sector companies and philanthropies to help vulnerable nations better prepare for weather-related disasters and better plan for long-term threats like steadily rising seas. Yes, this is hard, but there should be no question that the United States of America is stepping up to the plate. We recognize our role in creating this problem. We embrace our responsibility to combat it. We will do our part, and we will help developing nations do theirs. But we can only succeed in combating climate change if we are joined in this effort by every nation, developed and developing alike. Nobody gets a pass. The emerging economies that have experienced some of the most dynamic growth in recent years have also emitted rising levels of carbon pollution. It is those emerging economies that are likely to produce more and more carbon emissions in the years to come. So nobody can stand on the sidelines on this issue. We have to set aside the old divides. We have to raise our collective ambition, each of us doing what we can to confront this global challenge. This time, we need an agreement that reflects economic realities in the next decade and beyond. It must be ambitious, because that's what the scale of this challenge demands. It must be inclusive, because every country must play its part. And yes, it must be flexible, because different nations have different circumstances. Five years ago, I pledged America would reduce our carbon emissions in the range of 17 percent below 2005 levels by the year 2020. America will meet that target. And by early next year, we will put forward our next emission target, reflecting our confidence in the ability of our technological entrepreneurs and scientific innovators to lead the way. So today, I call on all major economies to do the same. For I believe, in the words of Dr. King, that there is such a thing as being too late. And for the sake of future generations, our generation must move toward a global compact to confront a changing climate while we still can. This challenge demands our ambition. Our children deserve such ambition. And if we act now, if we can look beyond the swarm of current events and some of the economic challenges and political challenges involved, if we place the air that our children will breathe and the food that they will eat and the hopes and dreams of all pros uh, posterity above our own short-term interests, we may not be too late for them. While you and I may not live to see all the fruits of our labor, we can act to see that the century ahead is marked not by conflict but by cooperation, not by human suffering but by human progress, and that the world we leave to our children and our children's children will be cleaner and healthier and more prosperous and secure. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that right there was uh, an important speech by Obama where he at least began to start recognizing the responsibility of the United States to, as one of the largest emitters, to change our ways, and more importantly, to begin an ambitious program. And of course, with the United States, we know it's not too easy with our current elections that will be taking place tomorrow. A lot will depend, of course, on who is elected on November 4th in the Senate, as well as in the House, where certain legislation would have to pass. But I think what's really important is the leadership that was expressed there. But I think the U.S. has, of course, a lot more to do when it comes to climate change. And it's important to see what was coming out with this summit. The other idea besides the summit with getting the pledges was also to set up an agenda in May and June of next year, 2015. That'll be the halfway point between Lima and Paris. Paris, there'll have to be a legally binding treaty regarding climate change. 
And that links very much with the UN Sustainable Development Goals because that is one of the goals. If this legally binding treaty is not created and most importantly ratified by all states, this of course will mean that that SDG will be very difficult to achieve. And I think what's really important is when President Obama addressed the point of those that have really done the least are really the ones that are facing the situation and circumstances the most. And I think that's why the next speech by uh, Kathy is just really one of the most powerful ones that she delivered to her brand new baby. And uh, we'll start with that one and then uh, we'll have discussion about the UN Climate Change Summit and any other activities on how we can look at things that we can do here in Hawaii. 500 candidates to represent the voice of civil society. From the Marshall Islands, please welcome Kathy Jetnil Kijuner. My family and I have traveled a long way to be here today, all the way from the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands encompasses more than two million square kilometers of ocean, and so it makes sense that our culture is one of voyaging and navigation. One of our most beloved legends features a canoe race between ten brothers. Their mother, holding a heavy bundle, begged each of her sons for a ride on their canoe. But only the youngest listened and took her along for the ride, not knowing that his mother was carrying the first sail. With the sail, he won the race and became chief. The moral of the story is to honor your mother and the challenges life brings. Climate change is a challenge that few want to take on, but the price of inaction is so high. Those of us from Oceania are already experiencing it firsthand. We've seen waves crashing into our homes and our breadfruit trees wither from the salt and drought. We look at our children and wonder how they will know themselves or their culture should we lose our islands. Climate change affects not only us islanders, it threatens the entire world. To tackle it, we need a radical change of course. This isn't easy, I know. It means ending carbon pollution within my lifetime. It means supporting those of us most affected to prepare for unavoidable climate impacts. And it means taking responsibility for irreversible loss and damage caused by greenhouse gas emissions. The people who support this movement are indigenous mothers like me, families like mine, and millions more, standing up for the changes needed and working to make them happen. I ask world leaders to take us all along on your ride. We won't slow you down. We'll help you win the most important race of all, the race to save humanity. I would now like to share with you a poem that I have written for my daughter, Matafele Benham. Dear Matafele Benham, you are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. You are thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Matafele Benham, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that, lo that lazy lounging lagoon, lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander, rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Matafele Benham, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Or should I say, 
no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here because we, baby, are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, jima, your country, and your president, too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, who like to pretend that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, floods of Algeria, Colombia, Pakistan, and all the hurricanes, earthquakes, and tidal waves didn't exist, still, there are those who see us, hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the fresh, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are teenagers, pet blooming petitions. We are families, biking, recycling, reusing, engineers, building, dreaming, designing, artists, painting, dancing, writing, and we are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the streets, marching hand in hand, chanting for change now. And they're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Felipinum, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes and sleep in peace because we won't let you down. You'll see. So it's generally not every day that you get a standing ovation in the UN General Assembly, especially from heads of states, but I think you can see the power behind the message of a young woman speaking on behalf of future generations and making a promise to not only her child, but also to the nation of the Marshall Islands, but also to the entire region of Oceania, that we will organize and that people will come together to do everything possible to ensure that we adopt a more robust human rights-based approach to the climate crisis. This was also, of course, just two days after the amazing People's March that took place. I was fortunate enough to be there with the indigenous peoples that were also having the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And it was amazing to see all of Sixth Avenue just covered with 400,000 folks. There was also teach-ins that took place starting Earlier in the week, there were even actions where they went down to Occupy Wall Street again regarding climate change. But it was a very full week bringing activists, academics, advocates from around the world to come together to, one, let their leaders know that we know you're meeting here at this UN General Assembly. We know every third Tuesday of every September this is when this entire process starts. But more importantly, we the people are going to make sure that we can really demand and hope for a better process in the future. And that was quite important to see the UN Climate Change Summit. The other meeting that was quite important that won't take place that often as well was the first ever UN World Conference on Indigenous People. The UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples was started with a resolution in Bolivia. Bolivia brought this resolution to the General Assembly to have a high level political meeting that would be known as the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And what it did was spark regional meetings that took place around the world. In March of 2013, we met 
in Australia to come up with a Pacific position, but there are meetings in all the other six indigenous regions of the world. And then last summer they met in Alta, Norway to come with the Alta Declaration, where thousands of indigenous peoples came together to see what they would propose for this World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. Then there was an entire year where maybe not enough happened. And then, of course, in May, the process really did get launched with a session in May, another meeting in June, another meeting in July, and the final negotiation in August. And what then came about, of course, was the two-day summit that took place on Monday and Tuesday, the 22nd and 23rd of September. What we're going to show is just a short uh, clip from News Channel that actually showed some of the important issues that we could look at here. Jorge Gestoso y Karina Cartagena nos acompañan en este momento en vivo para darnos detalles de esta cumbre. Hola, bienvenidos a ambos y quiero comenzar con Jorge. ¿Cuál es la conclusión más importante que se rescata de esta primera conferencia mundial sobre los pueblos indígenas? Jorge, bienvenidos. Gracias, Abraham. Yo diría que fundamentalmente es la perspectiva, es decir, acá estamos identificando que en el mundo el 5% de la población del planeta es indígena. Estamos hablando de que hay 900 millones de pobres en el mundo y de los cuales un tercio de ellos son indígenas, población rural indígena. Es decir, claramente identifica la problemática que tiene este sector de la población mundial. Dentro de eso también es interesante comentar que, como ustedes mencionaban, la participación para inaugurar esta conferencia mundial, la primera de los pueblos indígenas, Evo Morales decía que Bolivia es el único país del mundo en cuya constitución está contemplado, está plasmada las declaraciones de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas establecidos precisamente en la declaración de aquí, de las Naciones Unidas del 2007. También participaron... Otros dignatarios de nuestra región estuvo el presidente de México, Enrique Peña Nieto, quien absolutamente admitió que hay una verdad lacerante de la discriminación de los indígenas en su país. Rigoberta Menchó, ustedes escuchaban una de las, sus declaraciones, pero también mencionó que el racismo es una enfermedad mental, así de claro lo decía y así de grave esa declaración. En la mañana también... La CEPAL, es decir, la Comisión, de, de, la Comisión Económica para América Latina y el Caribe de las Naciones Unidas, CEPAL, revelaba un nuevo informe sobre la situación de los indígenas en nuestra región y mencionaba nuevas cifras. Hablaba que hay 826 tribus en América Latina, 45 millones de indígenas que representan aproximadamente el 8% de la población, es decir... Eh, situación mucho más clara de cuál es eh, el perfil de la realidad de los pueblos indígenas latinoamericanos, todos absolutamente golpeados muy fuertemente por el tema de la pobreza. Mañana lo que se espera en esa segunda jornada de esta conferencia sobre los pueblos indígenas es una declaración final y allí quizás lo más importante, Abraham, es que se hable de que están exigiendo que sean reconocidos como gobiernos estas poblaciones indígenas y que no sean tratados simplemente como invitados de segunda categoría en los eventos mundiales. La situación ha sido sumamente importante porque ha creado a nivel global, a nivel mundial, una clara conciencia de la realidad que se está viviendo eh, a través de generaciones de estos pueblos indígenas que prácticamente sería justo decir que han sido marginados históricamente. Jorge, mañana también comienza allí la cumbre mundial sobre el cambio climático. Se sabe que varios mandatarios ya están en el lugar. Tú mencionabas dos, Evo Morales de Bolivia y Enrique Peña Nieto de México, entre otros. ¿Quiénes participarán de esta cumbre? Si nos puedes eh, comentar la agenda que se tiene prevista. Bueno, básicamente quizás lo más interesante es que Evo Morales vuelve eh, a ser un factor, una pieza clave también en el tema del cambio climático. Y el cambio climático va a, va a sacar al tapete, digamos, la, la hipocresía 
de los países más contaminantes que no quieren comprometerse bajo ningún punto de vista a reducir sus niveles de emisión de, de gases tóxicos. Allí también, quizás lo más importante de la reunión sea que se van a tener que fijar nuevas metas con el tema del cambio climático ya desde el 2016 en adelante y veremos cuánta voluntad real de compromiso de avanzar en ese sentido podamos escuchar aquí en la sede de las Naciones Unidas en Nueva York. Ahí está, Jorge Estoso. Gracias por ese reporte. So that was a brief summary of some of the important issues that came up. Uh, while attending the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, the actual adoption of the outcome document had some important elements that I think shows new levels, really in international governance. Three that stand out, first and foremost, is that there will be an Undersecretary General for Indigenous Peoples. This person will serve directly underneath the Secretary General and will report to the General Assembly regarding indigenous people's rights around the world and also be responsible to actually mainstream indigenous rights through the UN specialized agencies. Most of us know only of UNICEF around Halloween time, but of course UNESCO, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Health Organization, and be able to then mainstream indigenous rights through all of those. Another important point besides just this new Undersecretary General, which will be quite important at the headquarters in New York, is indigenous governments and indigenous peoples have a special status. Most people now participate with an ECOSOC status, an economic and social cultural rights status that you fill out as an NGO. But indigenous peoples have been claiming, of course, we're not NGOs, we are indigenous peoples. And that new status has been agreed to and they'll be working on the document that then will create a new observer status for indigenous peoples. And the final thing that came out was that there would be in a way to enforce the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and its 46 articles. What it would do is that they were looking at revamping and kind of remodeling the UN expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, MRIP, which meets every July. They're going to modify it so that it can actually review how states are implementing the declaration. And of course, that's very important. Evo Morales was featured because they did integrate the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into the Bolivian Constitution. But of course, there's a lot more to do. There's an implementation gap. And they believe by reforming the actual MRIP, it will be a space to be able to bring issues by indigenous peoples, but also for states and indigenous peoples to have a constructive dialogue. So those are really the three new things that came out of this UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And it will be seen how that is implemented, but really the Climate Change Summit and the World Conference, two very important aspects of what's going on. There'll be a follow-up to the World Conference starting tomorrow in Chiang Mai in Thailand, where the Global Coordinating Committee will, the Global Coordinating Group will meet, and they will actually share some of the most important issues and more importantly explore next steps of how the global coordinating group will be able to represent the seven regions and how we'll be able to implement these important outcome document and its recommendations. That is kind of a focus of what did happen at the UN and what we can look at. There's also been very important uh, meetings at the Human Rights Council and the Universal Periodic Review. The Universal Periodic Review is actually looking at Fiji during this session there's an important side event that took place there. And um, we can kind of see if we can find the report. There's an important report right there on Fiji. That's Fiji Fair Play, a human rights agenda that was drafted by Amnesty International. And Amnesty International hosted a side event last week, Tuesday, that brought together Fiji civil society and Fiji government to be able to share what's happened since the last four and a half years during the first review of Fiji. And a lot, of course, has taken place. They had an election. They've had some constitutional reforms. There is now a parliament. But it was important to see the Pacific Island states showing up and participating. And 
that's really why the UPR is valuable. There also was then the launch of the US Civil Society Campaign at the UN because the United States will be reviewed in May of 2015. So in May of 2015, what will happen is every NGO can actually watch and every community can see the United States be reviewed by all of its peers. All 192 other countries will ask questions and make recommendations for human rights realization in the United States based on the reports by civil society that were turned in on September 15th. But just last week on Tuesday, the U.S. Human Rights Network launched its campaign focusing on economic, social, cultural rights because the U.S. hasn't ratified that covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, focusing specifically on human rights education. And what will happen between now and then is the U.S. Civil Society will have a video contest with three parts. The first part will be what's going on, allowing every person in the United States to make a short video based on an issue related to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to highlight the most important issues in our country. Second, oh, what you're going to do, allowing citizens to ask questions to their elected officials, and more importantly, giving ideas to states to ask questions in May. And third, is moving beyond the what's wrong to what we want. And that part of what we want will then ask people to make recommendations, specific actions that our federal government can take to improve the human rights condition in our country. So while Fiji was being reviewed this time, in May it'll be the United States, and that'll be quite historic for the U.S. in its second review. So people are organizing all across the country. There's a couple other things, though, that are happening that are quite important. Uh, the next thing that'll be happening at the U.N. is the U.N. Convention Against Torture. The U.N. Committee Against Torture will actually review the United States next week between November 10th and 14th. So over 60 NGOs from the United States of America will be meeting in Geneva to educate and engage with the UN Committee Against Torture to hold the US accountable for its obligations under international law relating to torture that the US has agreed to not practice. This will be an important review of five hours looking at the US record of torture. And the U.S., of course, has unfortunately only ratified three treaties. They've ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and the Convention Against Torture. We've actually been reviewed in March at the Human Rights Committee on Civil and Political Rights, in August on racial discrimination, and now November will be CAT. And then that will be a full review of all the different treaties that we've ratified. So we'll talk a little bit on 1125 for our last session of our sixth annual Human Rights Sustainability Campus Community Dialogue. But we'll, of course, begin working in 2015 about the UPR and actions we can take. One of the most important things that's really vital to many people is actually treaty ratification. And one of the most important treaties that's up for adoption and most importantly ratification is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, How much money do you have in your pocket right now? I have $40. 21 Could something that small... What's really important is the in activists are coming together to put pressure on the United States to make sure that they actually do ratify this convention. The convention focuses on persons with disabilities, but equally significant is it actually does focus on the U.S. role and leadership around the world. Already over 140 countries have ratified it, and we have not. So. Citizens in the U.S. are actually coming together to lobby the U.S. Senate because ratification of treaties needs two-thirds of the Senate vote. We need 67 votes. So one of the goals of the UPR in 2015 is for the U.S. to ratify this convention as well as other conventions. Uh, one that was mentioned by the U.N. Foundation at the start of our talk was CEDAW. 
and in giving example of how local city councils are adopting international human rights treaties. These are things, of course, that we can look at and we've done at our annual Human Rights Days in March. But this is a short video looking at the disability community coming together and most importantly to demand Senate to take action. And this is really what the UN is about. It's not other countries and the UN forcing countries to do things. It's actually allowing people to put pressure on the government to do what's right and more importantly, what's the growing norm in human rights around the world. So we'll show this short clip about the coalition that's organizing on ratification of the CRPD. And then uh, we'll wrap up our event with a brief look at some of Obama's statements at the UN General Assembly. Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And what we know what we know in the US is people are aging into their disabilities. So this issue is one that affects most people. We have 20 million veterans in this country, and 5.5 million of them have a disability. So it's a personal connection. And a lot of them sustain those disabilities serving in conflicts around the world far off the shore of the United States. So we've been in strong support of the CRPD. Well, I, th I think that if we can get the CRPD on the floor, I believe we'll have the votes. The problem is there's two or three people in the Senate that hate the United Nations, think this will take away our sovereignty, so they're going to they're do anything they can to stop it and block it. That's the problem we have. You know what? Finally, a righteous mission of worldwide equal rights for the disabled with the support of war heroes and Senate elder statesmen. In a world gone mad, America can lead and reclaim its exceptional moral authority. They needed 66 votes. It's a treaty, two-thirds of the Senate, and it failed. Okay, can you make your announcement again, please, sir? Can you just make your announcement again? I don't know if they were paying attention okay. very well. Okay. May I have your attention? My name is Lieutenant Samuel Faz, Jr. of the United States Capitol Police. You're engaging in unlawful activity you are ordered to cease and desist or you will be placed under arrest. Well, if I want to travel overseas um, by our not supporting the CRPD, it means that I don't have the same equal access to transportation services and buildings in other countries that I would have here. This is the kind of injustice that people with disabilities face. In America, we all rallied for the ADA. We rallied for Olmstead. And here in America, we are trying to undo years of wrong policy by institutionalizing people, by institutionalizing people through Olmstead implementation. Many of these very same senators that we're trying to reach voted in support of the ADA, voted in support of the ADA Amendments Act. We need to go in and ask them not to abandon us and to vote for us and the one billion people around the world. Um, I have been working for 20 years, and what I have witnessed is that one of the great human rights violations, the most pervasive human rights violations in the world today, are that children and adults with disabilities are still being put away in institutions. They're called orphanages, they're called psychiatric facilities, they're called nursing homes. The world's changed, it's smaller, people travel. More people with disabilities have jobs that take them overseas. So. More people are in business, more people are traveling. Not only that, we have new uh, technologies, software programs and hardware that is so much different than what we had 25 years ago. I'm here because Americans deserve to have the ability to work, study, volunteer, travel around the world. We should have been number one. Instead, if we ratify this week, we'll be 149. 
but we'll take 140 pounds mm -hmm. because our brothers and sisters all over the world are counting on us. So we understand that a lot of them are concerned about their elections, but we think they should be just as concerned about us as they are about the minority of people who spread a campaign of lies and misinformation to frighten families and to get them to turn out in huge numbers. We don't have a lot of money, but we have all these people. And for every person here, there's thousands more that they represent back home. I've been working on the CRPD now for 14 years. 14 years. First to work to get the UN to write it and pass it, and now for these last four or five years to get the United States to ratify it. I know all of you join me in the sense of outrage, sadness, shame, that we feel that the United States of America has not yet ratified this treaty. And if we were to adopt this treaty and say, we will hold ourselves to the same standards as all countries around the world, look at us according to those standards, then we'll be in a much stronger position to point fingers and to say, you cannot put people away because they have a disability. You cannot treat them as subhuman. You cannot let the children die just because they have a disability. If we're gonna have that moral leadership, we have to ratify this treaty. What a fantastic showing from our community in the Hart Senate office building. These advocates are now hitting the offices, reminding that they are watching this vote. We stand together. We won't be divided. We're going to ratify the CRPD uh, thanks to these folks' voices. So quite a uh, powerful short film that just features and explores some of the important issues around the CRPD and how people are actually organizing together to make sure that it becomes a reality in the United States. Uh, that really brings us to almost the end of our program that's focusing specifically on all of the developments happening at the United Nations. It's been quite an amazing session so far that was launched in September. It's been one where the U.S. is more involved than in many previous years. We have definitely, in the human rights field, actually will conclude with everything we've ratified next week at the Committee Against Torture. At the U.N. Climate Change Summit, we actually did have our head of state speak, which isn't always the case. And also, U.S. played a very active role at the U.N. World Conference on Indigenous Peoples as well. Of course, the uh, important speech is the one that the heads of state give every year, and that is one where the states say what their priorities are. And, of course, during that week in New York, everything's going on. There's the Global Clinton Foundation initiative. There's meetings all around the city. But what we thought we'd conclude with then is just some of Barack Obama's words at the opening of the UN General Assembly. And what happens every year is all the heads of state, all 193 speak and give the priorities of what they want to concentrate on. And it's really a point for us to see if our president's really saying what we think is most important. In a way, it's, it's kind of like the State of the Union, but it's the State of the Union for the world. It's the State of the world where different heads of state say what the most important challenges are of what we'll look at. It's also important to think about what is next, and I think one of the things that we talked about that's quite valuable is the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We'll be looking at those at our next session on the 25th. On the 25th of November, we'll be having activities from 12 to 1.30 with all of the islands coming together to look at some of the 17 sustainable development goals and giving examples of how they're actually being engaged at here at the Hawaii level, here in the islands. Then 
Uh, we'll also have a Model UN in the evening at Brigham Young University that will look at that. And then we're hoping for an event on the 26th, really on the eve of Thanksgiving, that will look at the sustainable development goals and more importantly, examples of social change here in Hawaii and how people are coordinating and organizing. That will then put us to the end of the semester and the year. There, of course, will be the commemoration of the anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, known as the UDHR. And then, of course, we'll start off January with a new series focusing on the important thing of the opening of the legislature, but also really that phase of the Universal Periodic Review and what we need to do next. So we'll conclude now with some short statements by President Barack Obama here at the UN and what he sees as the priorities for the United States. Around the globe, there are signposts of progress. The shadow of world war that existed at the founding of this institution has been lifted, and the prospect of war between major powers reduced. The ranks of member states has more than tripled, and more people live under governments they elected. Hundreds of millions of human beings have been freed from the prison of poverty, with the proportion of those living in extreme poverty cut in half. And the world economy continues to strengthen after the worst financial crisis of our lives. Today, whether you live in downtown Manhattan or in my grandmother's village more than 200 miles from Nairobi, you can hold in your hand more information than the world's greatest libraries. Together, we've learned how to cure disease and harness the power of the wind and the sun. The very existence of this institution is a unique achievement. The people of the world committing to resolve their differences peacefully and to solve their problems together. I often tell young people in the United States that despite the headlines, this is the best time in human history to be born. For you are more likely than ever before to be literate, to be healthy, to be free to pursue your dreams. And yet there is a pervasive unease in our world, a sense that the very forces that have brought us together have created new dangers and made it difficult for any single nation to insulate itself from global forces. As we gather here, an outbreak of Ebola overwhelms public health systems in West Africa and threatens to move rapidly across borders. Russian aggression in Europe recalls the days when large nations trampled small ones in pursuit of territorial ambition. The brutality of terrorists in Syria and Iraq forces us to look into the heart of darkness. Each of these problems demands urgent attention, but they also are symptoms of a broader problem. The failure of our international system to keep pace with an interconnected world. We collectively have not invested adequately in the public health capacity of developing countries. Too often we have failed to enforce international norms when it's inconvenient to do so. And we have not confronted forcefully enough the intolerance, sectarianism, and hopelessness that feeds violent extremism in too many parts of the globe. Fellow delegates, we come together as United Nations with a choice to make. We can renew the international system 
that has enabled so much progress, or we can allow ourselves to be pulled back by an undertow of instability. We can reaffirm our collective responsibility to confront global problems or be swamped by more and more outbreaks of instability. And for America, the choice is clear. We choose hope over fear. We see the future not as something out of our control, but as something we can shape for the better through concerted and collective effort. We reject fatalism or cynicism when it comes to human affairs. We choose to work for the world as it should be, as our children deserve it to be. There's much that must be done to meet the test of this moment. But today I'd like to focus on two defining questions at the root of so many of our challenges. Whether the nations here today will be able to renew the purpose of the UN's founding, and whether we will come together to reject the cancer of violent extremism. First, all of us, big nations and small, must meet our responsibility to observe and enforce international norms. We are here because others realize that we gain more from cooperation than conquest. One hundred years ago, a world war claimed the lives of many millions, proving that with the terrible power of modern weaponry, the cause of empire ultimately leads to the graveyard. It would take another world war to roll back the forces of fascism, the notions of racial supremacy, and form this United Nations to ensure that no nation can subjugate its neighbors and claim their territory. Recently, Russia's actions in Ukraine challenge this post-war order. Here are the facts. After the people of Ukraine mobilized popular protests and calls for reform, their corrupt president fled. Against the will of the government in Kiev, Crimea was annexed. Russia poured arms into eastern Ukraine, fueling violent separatists. And a so that is just a taste of the important speech that uh, Obama gave. Uh, we're now closing out the special UN session for the fall semester, and we look forward to working together at the next one on 1125, focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals here. And I uh, thank you again for joining us, and Maluhia Mekapono, and see everyone next later.